Hello and good evening and welcome to um, the Chagish Mayo webinar. This is a spring series of webinars and um, just to let everybody know that uh, this webinar is being recorded. Firstly, my name is Enda Gagan. I'm based here in Chagish in Ballina and I'm joined this evening by my colleagues uh, Jacinta O'Neill based in Chagish Westport and Tom Kelly in Chagash and Balna, Vivine Silk, the regional manager will be um, taking questions um, throughout the, the evening and we'll answer them at the end. Um, questions can be asked on the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom. So the team for this evening's um, webinar is health and safety and wellbeing. And tonight, Jacinta will be talking about uh, giving us an update on TAMS courses and um, an update on the Code of Farming Practice documents and how to fill it on that. Tom Kelly will be talking a bit on health and safety around the whole area of machinery. And indeed myself, I'm going to be having a chat with Dr. Patrick McSharry, um, who is kindly joining us, joining us tonight and he's based in Enniscrone in County Sligo. So without further ado, um, I might ask the other panelists just to turn off their cameras and myself and Patrick will just go into our um, bit of a talk here. Anyway, Patrick, thanks very much for joining us tonight. And um, it's great to have the opportunity to, I suppose, talk to you in, in this platform. Thank you, Enda, for, for having me, and I'm delighted to be able to, to give a little bit about my experience with regards to, I suppose, the overall well-being and health of, of your members in Chagas. Yeah. Thank you. No problem at all. I suppose, look, at in these very strange times, Patrick, and when, when this started last year, a few of us did think that we'd be, we'd be a year down the road and we'd be we'd be still working from home and still we'll say in this um, level five lockdown and that. So I suppose, look, there's a lot of issues out there with farmers and you come across them, especially with rural isolation and everything. And people are getting, we'll say, maybe a bit down and a bit, we'll say, anxious about it. So I suppose what advice would you give to, to farmers and staying healthy in these difficult times like yeah, it, it is. It certainly is extremely challenging time for everyone. Um, I suppose regardless of the, the timing and the circumstances, we should all always, and, and I would tend to gen, give the general lifestyle advice with regards to smoking sensation um, for those who are smoking, if they come into the surgery or if you're talking to them on the phone or that. Obviously, it is difficult circumstances for sure, but we can we can often just talk through that because it is a significant risk factor for for many illnesses. It's always good to watch the diet, you know, low salt um, from the point of view of high blood pressure uh, and a big cardiovascular risk factor. Uh, low sugar in the diet can either prevent or manage or help treat diabetes or prevent going on to diabetes and though those who are prone to diabetes. Um, it's important, it's, it's a big enough area really, but to identify some problem alcohol use, and you mentioned there stress and anxiety, and if you're using alcohol from the point of view of, of almost like a medication uh, to, to treat some anxiety or, or low mood or that, that's, it's important to identify that and address it. Um, general lifestyle advice is always good to have exercise. Now it's a very physical job, your job, um, but oftentimes to dedicate you know, 30 minutes, five times a week, which is what the Irish Heart Foundation would say from a, a cardiovascular health point of view is important. And that has added on benefits from a, a, a mental health point of view, because it's not a it's not a time associated with the physical exertion of the day job of work and uh, which can be very difficult to find 30 minutes, five times a week. But that's the general advice. Um, it is most important, really, at this moment in time when there's such social isolation, less social interactions, to really look out for one another more than ever. Um, and, and really, from, from the point of view of, of mental health, 
um, you know, th there is there's less chances for social interactions from the point of view of the marks being um, more online. And, um, you know, you're not seen as much or we're told to, to stay away and keep our social distance. So it's important to, to still be there for your family and friends and neighbours like you always were, whether it's on the end of the phone or at a safe distance away, just to be able to identify when somebody is struggling um, or somebody is mentioning a complaint, which may be potentially a, a worry and symptom. And it's important to address that regardless of the circumstances. So, you know, you can get into the more specifics and, and I think, uh, cardiovascular health is important for, from the point of view of uh, looking at your blood pressure, maybe at a once a yearly checkup. Mention the smoke and get a cholesterol check maybe every every year or so. Uh, check that you're not a diabetic or if you are a diabetic, how well that's controlled. Coming into the summer months in particular, and I see it a lot, especially as, as the farming community are older and, and as, as they advance in years, you see a lot of um, uh, sun damaged skin and, and that is a risk factor in itself for uh, skin cancer so um, often not mentioned but just to keep the the with the outdoor work a sun cream on or a broad brim hat um, that's important uh, regardless of of uh, I suppose whether anyone is or isn't uh, at this time and most people in some shape or form are stressed in some way but it's important to watch out from the point of view of uh, mental health because already the farming community is, is considered a, a, an at-risk because of the time pressures that you're under from a work point of view. You tend to get a, a, a times of, of, of work where there's lambing season and that, where there's huge uh, pressure. There's huge stress and pressure on people there. Like all that. working hours, you know, there's no such thing as, uh, as all of you know, of, of any type of structure to nine to five, like maybe, maybe other professions can enjoy. You know, uh, there is no end to the working day. And it's really important just to identify those those areas. Um, obviously, you'll cover your, your health and safety, which is a, is a broad area from the point of view of, of farm safety and accident. Mm, exactly. Um, I suppose you mentioned there, Patrick, there, the cardiovascular vascular. And we'll say just, what's the symptoms of heart problems? If, if a man is, is, is beginning to suffer, we'll say, heart problems, what, or indeed a woman or whatever, what are the symptoms they should be looking for? Yeah, so there, 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 it is a significant um, risk of premature death in, in people is heart problems, heart disease, stroke, and they tend to be overlap with the, the risk factors that, that will be considered. So somebody who's a smoker or has a significant family history of heart problems where that a brother or their father or mother died suddenly from a heart attack, that in itself it should be something that, well, I should look at maybe keeping an eye on my cholesterol or my blood pressure. But then specifically when you get into symptoms, um, and, and just to mention a lot of the things that here that we'd be saying is telling people to get checked, the vast majority will turn out to be of no concern. It's not to have, have, have everyone concerned that I have this or that after a talk or a conversation with, with me, but just to mention that always worth checking out. And if it's a, if, if it's a case of getting an ECG or a blood test done by, by your GP and everything is fine, well, no harm in that, you know, but things like chest pain or if you're more breathless than usual, either on exertion, walking up a hill, sometimes cardiovascular uh, symptoms can present with not the typical center of the chest pain, but it might be more your left arm or into your jaw, uh, maybe some palpitations where you feel your heart beating fast in your chest when you exert yourself and that hadn't happened before. Uh, your ankles might swell up a little bit. So there are just some symptoms that um, may be indicative of, of uh, heart problems and would be worthwhile pursuing and getting checked out uh, so they'd be definitely symptoms not to not to ignore, not to ignore, and not to sit on. You know, yeah. and that that's been the the experience of uh, many general practitioners and emergency departments over the course of the last year, where you may be able to just you know jump in the car and say I'm down, I have a bit of chest pain here, and you get that checked out. Where people had been told to to avoid hospitals, told to avoid their general practitioner unless it was urgent, and really the case of of you know it, it's it's not urgent once it's been deemed and assessed and fully investigated, you know. So don't yeah. be afraid to to pick up the phone and say I have this or that, 
or come down and say I'll consider that to your GP uh, because it's important to check people uh, Yeah, I think there's a, a, a lot of that. A lot of people will say putting off the thing of going to the GP because of the, the current COVID um, yeah. crisis and that. So it is just uh, nice to get that um, reminder there that indeed that you should be visiting and you should be going if you have any of these symptoms or are indeed worried or just, just take out that the phone. Some other symptoms ended that maybe you might say, well, I'll see how that goes or see mm. how that pans out and I'll leave it for a while. Would, you know, maybe not as, as alarming because I think, you know, chest pain, most people will say or have to say to somebody, they'll say, go and get that checked. But, you know, things like a, a new cough, if you're, if you're not usually coughing and you've suddenly started coughing and it's not, you've been treated maybe for an infection of that, but a new cough uh, noted to be hoarse, um, trouble and change in your bowel pattern, you know, so if you have new constipation or diarrhea or you're passing some blood in the bowel motion, these are symptoms not to be to be sitting on and watching, you know, over over the course of leaving it weeks or that, like, just pick up the phone and say, well, I need an appointment or I want this checked out or that checked out or what do you think I'm having um, some weight loss or that. Just just don't be afraid to, to pick up the phone, uh, up the phone and, and have them checked. Yeah, and just to remind the, the, the viewers there, there, um, there is a Q&A tab there on the bottom of the screen to use if you want to ask um, questions. And if we can't um, answer them tonight, we will get back to you. Um, so just another thing there, Patrick, I suppose, with the whole current issue and current um, situation with COVID and people are not going out as much, the pubs are closed, the mart is is off and that. It's putting, I suppose, a lot of people at risk of depression and, and just feeling down on themselves and maybe getting overly anxious and that. And I suppose, I suppose, what are the risk factors there for farming community in terms of depression? Yeah, so uh, I think the big the big one really would be would be the the isolated nature of the work, and even there was there was a um, a review or a document up on on Chagas uh, that I was looking at earlier that that identified specific pre-COVID areas like um, social isolation, the time pressures where where you're 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 into into seasonal work and you've you've X number of of um, even uh, the the season for lambing or uh, dry days, even and that, and significant pressure to get a, a, a finite amount of work done, and then you have the financial worries and uncertainties around that with pricing and that. Um, they're all they're all considered risk factors for putting people under more uh, stress and anxiety. Um, uh, and add to that, then apart from your long working day or, or maybe an endless day at times into the night and. Uh, the significant burden uh, that has has affected every walk of life, but but in particular with with regards applications and, and grants and the bureaucracy is is significant associated with, you know, and, and I'm sure mem, mem, many of the viewers would say that the the farm uh, all day and night rather than than be faced with the the bureaucracy that that's become part of the the job, and then you have the hazardous work when when people are um, either sleep deprived and and, and um, uh, doing difficult job and, and, and operating machines and that and um, so th all of that does add to the the risk factors for either um, stress anxiety and maybe a more significant depression um, and, and if you add in your pandemic on top of that where the marts are, are now you know online you're, you're not meeting people either in a social interaction the football match is not on at the weekend um, you're, you're, there's no there's no mass for you know religious religious services are online um, even 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 pursuing religious faith is itself protective from a mental health point of view leaving aside the social interaction of that um, so th there is there is significant uh, additional pressures on an already pressurized um, uh, workforce so um, just that that should at least make people aware that number one they're not uh, if they are feeling a little bit down on themselves stressed anxious they're certainly not alone I mean we've seen it in in general practice on a day-to-day -day basis it's it's certainly significantly increased and 
often one of the one of the real areas of of difficulty with especially with uh, psychological stress or mental illness is that almost as if they're somebody is suffering uh, alone or are or, or, or they're feeling more isolated or alone and, and that can can really be far from the truth from the point of view of how prevalent it is from the mental health point of view and and we'll say patrick how we'll say if i was suffering from depression how would i know that i am suffering from depression yeah, it, it, it's not as clear cut, you know, um, as, as as saying, you know, I have depression or I have low mood or that. You know, oftentimes people can can, can be told. I've been told to come and look at um, uh, my stress levels or my anxiety levels. Or I'm told now. Some people may identify immediately. I'm I'm suffering from low mood. I'm feeling you know, more and more stressed, I'm anxious, I'm not sleeping, you know, I'm as far on as I'm feeling hopeless for the future and all this. But then there can be more subtle where somebody is more irritable, their appetite is down, uh, their energy, they're more fatigued, low in energy, more fatigued. Um, one, of, one of the areas would be, you know, you're not enjoying the areas of, um, of life that you would have previous, either the work itself, uh, are hobbies that would always have been a source of, of entertainment or enjoyment um, and you're not getting the same enjoyment out of that as before um, and then the more significant you know you actually feel very low on yourself your mood is low you're, you're basically find it more and more difficult to cope with uh, daily activities feeling more hopeless for the future or uh, thoughts of harming yourself or others and, and they're the more significant and really, I suppose it, it, it goes across the spectrum from, from just being a little bit anxious and, and more stressed at specific times, which can be very appropriate, to a more significant depression that needs, you know, really a, a significant input from a professional point of view. Um, and it's important just to address it a, 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 and to identify it because the big take home end, if I was to say anything tonight, would be mm. both from a physical illness point of view with some of those symptoms or from the heart point of view or from a psychological stress is that there's significant um, uh, treatment available. And, and that treatment could range from the, the first conversation you have with a friend or family member or neighbor to say that, you know, I'm struggling a little bit here and I think I need a little bit of support out of this. And right the way up from that to uh, talking to your general practitioner about it, who's, who's used to it and the conversation before or after it, maybe along the exact same lines of, of uh, either a, a mental health crisis or, or depression or uh, some anxiety that somebody is suffering, that there's really good supports out there. And it's really about tapping into it and not suffering in silence and continuing on and, 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 and really, you know, not addressing it. It's, it's the same as I would say about somebody coming in, they're, they're often, most of the time anyway, and hopefully after tonight's talk, not putting up with their chest pain for three, four, five weeks. Yes. Or, or yes. their so similarly, why would you do that with uh, mental health distress or low mood or, or feeling down or anxious in yourself, but just to address it like everything yeah. else, you know? I, I think... What, what we need to realize is that depression is like hitting your finger with a hammer. You will address it, you're going to, we'll say, get a plaster for it, you're going to fix it, and it should be the same with depression. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. No, yeah. And it can go right the way from, you know, oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll talk to somebody and, and, and that conversation, maybe the, the therapy, in itself and it will end there you know and that there's no more need for further intervention or there's one or two sessions of counseling or you know some people may feel as if you know i've said it now to somebody and, and i'm feeling a bit better and i might take it a little bit further and, and and chat to the gp about it or the next time i'm down i'll say it uh, or or it, it may present a, a little bit more significant where it's it's requiring input immediately and it'll be a case of contacting your GP there and then or out of hours general practice but there's a lot and and for those who, who feel like you know I'm wondering is it this or is it that maybe just picking up the phone for the Samaritans and I, yes. I, I'll put their updated details uh, available for for the viewers as well because I think they're great they're 24-hour 
uh, service. Um, 116123 is the phone number. And just to be able to pick up the phone and say, well, this is what's going on. You know, what do you think of it as, as somebody on the end of the phone who's, who's, who's working on this every day or be at a house? Um, you know, it's important that people people reach out to the, the, the support that's there. And the support is fantastic and people do so well. So it's not a case of, you know, I'll, I'll struggle on or, or I'll, I'll be able to manage this. But it's a case of getting the help that's there and literally turning the tide on people's lives from, from one of a struggle, uh, struggle to survive, exactly. somebody who's, who's thriving in their day-to-day activities. And, and you know, that, that does take, take time and maybe some interventions, but it's, it's, it's fantastic to come out the other end of that as well. Perfect. Well, Patrick, um, I'm conscious that you have a, another, um, another event to, to go to we'll say after this. Um, I suppose just your take home points there are very, we'll say, good and very relevant. Um, I'll put up this webinar has been recorded, so it's going up on the Chagas YouTube channel. And I'll have all the um, contact numbers and the services put on that um, recording on the night. And I just would like to thank, I suppose, on behalf of the general public, I'd just like to compliment you and all your staff and indeed all the frontline workers out there in the country for working so hard during this time and for keeping us all safe um, so just a very big thank you um, for that and indeed thank you very much for coming on tonight Patrick and giving us um, your time and your experience and indeed if there is any questions or that we will endeavour to um, answer them and we may be in I, may be in contact with you tomorrow Patrick or whatever. Yeah I'd be more than, more than happy and, uh, and, and, and thanks for having me on and uh, best best of best of luck to all your all your members and thank thanks. you thanks very much patrick so with that we'll just um go across there to jacinta um i'd ask jacinta just to and maybe um just turn on your 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 camera there jacinta yeah now. No, thank you, Wenda. Now, this evening, um, welcome everybody to our webinar this evening, and I'm going to go through a couple of topics with you. The first of these is an update on the TAMS health and safety courses and secondly how to complete and use the farm safety code of practice which is also referred to as the risk assessment document. Now the targeted agriculture modernization scheme was introduced in 2017 which is referred to as TAMS and it requires that all applicants complete the TAMS health and safety course and you may, may ask, why is this? Well, unfortunately, it's due to the high number of farm accidents and fatalities that occur each year on Irish farms. And at this point, I would like to acknowledge that a lot of our viewers, I'm sure, are personally aware of somebody that has suffered through a farm accident or fatality. And I would like to pass my sympathies on to anybody that has been affected in this way. Now, in relation to the TAMS course, it must be done within the previous five years before the date of application for grant payment, or if the applicant has completed the green cert, which is the level six advanced certificate in agriculture within the previous five years as well, this is also acceptable. For registered farm partnerships or a company where you have a young farmer, the course must be completed by the young farmer. And for registered farm partnerships with two eligible young farmers, only one of these applicants needs to have completed the course. Now, I would recommend that both complete it, but only one is required to. Now, in relation to your TAMS grant application, you need to provide proof that you have attended the TAMS course and your claim for payment will not be processed until evidence of this completion of the course is provided. And this is provided through your Chagas advisor or the course provider 
who will issue a letter confirming the course date of attendance, the name of and address and herd number and partnership number, if applicable, for the TAMS applicant. And this will be submitted to the Department of Agriculture with your application for the TAMS payment. Now, Chagas TAMS health and safety courses the same as everybody else's had to be suspended um, about a year ago due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, they were renewed again in autumn briefly where they were held outdoors, but again, these had to be stopped because of the second lockdown. Now, since then, online courses have been approved by the Department of Agriculture, and these are coming on stream currently. Now, for anybody that is required to register for a course for their TAMS application or if they want to do a farm safety course just for their general information, um, the contact the Chagas Westport office and the number is there um, on your screen 0982833 and there will take your name and details and contact you then when a course is coming up. Now, as I said, these are online courses, not um, face to face or classroom courses, so you will require access to computer, laptop and an email address. And that's where you will be sent a link for the Zoom call to participate in the course, just the way you are um, watching the seminar tonight. Now, just to get into a little bit of the legal terminology about um, farm safety statement and the code of practice. Um, this basically, a safety statement is enforced by the Health and Safety Authority the HSA and it is a legal requirement and it is through the HSA that on-farm inspections are carried out, safety inspections that is as well. Now since 1989 health and safety legislation requires that farmers have a written health and safety management document which is more commonly referred to as a safety statement and since 2005 farmers with up to three employees have been allowed to follow a farm safety code of practice in place of the safety statement. Now, this code of practice is designed to help farmers meet their obligations under the Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act 2005. So it is basically a document to help you meet your legal requirement. And I'll speak more about that document as we go on. For farmers to comply, they must either prepare their own safety statement or use the code of practice sorry, the Code of Practice Risk Assessment and implement their action plan. So what is the Code of Practice or the Safety Statement? Well, technically, a safety statement is essentially a written plan on how you intend to manage your farm safely. And the way it's used is that it contains 11 sections of everyday farming life, um, most of which are applicable to the general farm. And at, at the end of it, there is an action list, which is a very, very important part of it. So you go through the hazards on the farm associated with the relevant sections, be it livestock, farm machinery, chemicals, whatever the situation is, and you assess the risk of injury associated with those hazards. So quite simply, it is a written document that helps you to identify risks that are on your farm. So you write down how you plan to eliminate or control the hazards with the help of practical solutions and prompts which are included in the document to help prevent accidents, injuries and fatalities. Now, putting this document into action is the key secret to how this will help to reduce accidents on the farms. There's no point in writing things down unless you're actually going to carry them out. So putting this document into action will significantly reduce the likelihood of an accident or worse occurring. So the whole focus is on the prevention of deaths, injuries and ill health amongst farmers, their families and anyone present on farms, be it an employee or a visitor. So the key requirements that you need to show through enacting your code of practice document is that you as a farmer employer, employer can show that you have taken all reasonably practical measures to protect safety and health at work. Now, so this is the document itself, which is the new version of the Farm Safety Code of Practice. Now, this is out a couple of years. It was launched in 2018. And for anybody that still has the older version, which was a cream colored book, it's the green cover book that you now need to use. So just taking one section, for example, um, you go through the information on the hazard. In this case, if you look at the right hand side there, you'll see tractors, farm vehicles and ATVs and it details some of the risks involved in that category and the statistics involved as well. Now, my colleague, Tom Kelly, will be going through some of those statistics um, with you later. So when you move on then to the next section, it is quite simply a list 
of, in this situation, tractors, farm vehicles and quads may be on your farm. And you complete it by reading the information about the hazard on the opposite page, which I've, I've already spoken about. And then you itemize the list of vehicles that are on your farm. If there's a couple of tractors, for example, generally people distinguish them with the, the make of them or the color or the year or whatever the case may be. And then you go through the checklist on the left hand side, which are the control measures. Now you may not be able to read them there, but I'll just um, pick a couple of examples for um, one of them being that the brakes are in good working order and adequate for the work undertaken. So if you pick that and you go across and see if that is the case for all the vehicles on your farm. Another simple thing there would be that um, the vehicle is always started and operated from the correct position or the passengers are only carried where the manufacturer has provided a seat and seatbelt for this purpose. So quite simply, you go across um, and check that the safety control measure is in place for each item listed and it's tick for a yes, X for it's not in place or NA if it's not applicable. Now step five is where you want to list any additional controls or farm safety measures that you have taken that are not listed above on that page. For example, if there's a, a safety box to store farm vehicle keys that are out of reach of children or something like that. And the most important thing for this is that if you haven't ticked yes to all of those control measures, um, that you write what you need to do on your safety for the safety control measure and indicate it on the action list, which is later on in the book in page 29. So that's what I'm showing you now, which is the farm safety action list. And this is literally where you list what needs to be done. For example, in machinery, if there's a broken light on um, one of the tractors, you specify that. And then what you need to do, the action that I must take on my farm is to replace the light or repair it. And the most important thing is that it is done and that you state and sign it when it's done because you're not in compliance until you do the required action. So it's kind of like a reminder checklist or a security check to try and keep things prepared and safe on your farm to prevent accidents. Now, the other sections that the Code of Practice um, deals with, I'll just go through them quickly, um, the majority of which apply to all farms. The first one being children, young persons and older farmers, which are a very vulnerable category and are involved in many accidents each year, unfortunately. The second are tractors, farm vehicles and quads, which I've dealt with. Machinery has its own section as, of, as does livestock. And then we've got farmyards and buildings and working at height slurry handling and harvesting. They are two new sections in the revised edition that was brought out a couple of years ago. They, they each have their own section now. And then we've got workshop repairs or working with um, timber, electricity and chemicals have their own section. And then finally, farmer's health, which as we've heard already is also very significant to look after. Now, there is also an online option available, which I'll just mention, and basically it's a facility to do the Farm Safety Code of Practice online. It's an electronic version. And once you um, log in and save your details, you can come back to it and complete it or update it at any time. You have it saved to look at and update it. And the place to access that is through either the HSA website or as you can see there on your screens, www.farmsafely.com. And another thing that I just want to mention is that by doing it online doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to prompt farm inspection, but I can talk about that more later. Now, just a, a summary of what a farmer's responsibility is to try and provide um, for a safe and secure working environment on their farm. As I said there, that your farm is a safe place and you provide a safe system of work. That work is planned and organised safely and efficiently. Something simple like not leaving things scattered around the yard is one very simple example of how to avoid a common cause of accidents, which be slips, trips and falls. Um, an obvious thing when you're saying it, but unfortunately doesn't always happen, is try to keep equipment safe and in good working order, carrying out repairs as they occur instead of it's happening and putting you under pressure when you're under time, time pressure already. 
it's also important that if you have somebody working on the farm with you, that you provide them with instruction, training and supervision and that they are fully competent and safety aware before they carry out work on your farm for you. For example, a couple of years ago, I was giving a course that a farmer was attending and he asked, could um, a young lad that was working for him come and attend the next course, which was a great incentive to try and just get that employee aware, a bit more aware of farming safely. Um, safe storage and use of hazardous substances is also the responsibility of the farmer and prevention of ill health, be it through wearing safety gear and personal protection equipment is also very important and seeking competent advice if you aren't presently skilled on working with something, either try and get a training course on upskilling to do it or what might be more suitable would be to hire somebody else to do it. For example, if you need to get trees cut down on the farm or something like that, it might be wiser to hire somebody to do it rather than borrow a chainsaw or something that you're not familiar with and not have the correct safety equipment to go with it. Just seem to have about two minutes there. Okay. Um, now, just to quickly summarize um, the end, that how can you uh, safety proof your farm. There's three basic points I have there to take care, take time and take action. It's always important when you're working on your own to let somebody else know where you are. So just um, tell somebody when you're going out where you're going and an estimate of how long you'll be. Keep a charge mobile with you so that in the case you get an accident or breakdown that you're able to contact somebody and keep snacks and drinks with you for the same reason, because if you get delayed and you're getting hungry or thirsty and irritable, you'll lose your concentration. Using uh, personal protective equipment I've mentioned already. Take time, as Dr. McSherry has um, dealt with, physical and mental health, diet and adequate sleep are all very important. Take action, use technology and contracting instead of trying to take on an awkward job yourself, as I've mentioned already. So the key is to actively manage safety, allow specific time to this, try and do a routine check on your farm, for example, once a week for things that are broken in disrepair or unsafe and put things right. And very, very importantly, keep a note of your air code because in the event that emergency services are needed, it will definitely speed up the time that they will get to your farm. So just to quickly summarize, safety is in your hands. Take personal responsibility for it. Make your code of practice a living document to protect you, your family, and all farm visitors. Don't rely on good luck, but on good management to help prevent accidents and to help keep all on your farm safe. Thank you. That's great, Jacinta. Thanks very much there. Um, I just ask you to stop sharing there, Jacinta, and then Tom Kelly, just to turn on his camera and his presentation. Um, Jacinta, just a, a, a thing there that you said about the error code. I think it's very important, the error code. And if, if it's one thing that people do tonight, maybe is take a minute tonight to go get your air code and actually put it into your phone in the contact details on your phone as air code. And just maybe set an exercise for yourself and learn it off. It's a very uh, important thing. So Tom, you're going to talk to us a bit there on health and safety. So um, I'll hand over to you there now, Tom. Okay, thanks, Inda, and good evening to all our listeners. My focus this evening is on the prevention of farm accidents and fatalities on farms, with a particular focus on tractors and machinery. So just looking at the causes of deaths in agriculture and forestry in 2020, or last year, and bearing in mind that uh, agriculture and forestry accounts for around 7% of the total uh, workforce and accounts for more than 50% of all workplace fatalities. So looking at the tractors and other vehicles, in particular quad bikes, uh, they accounted for 10 deaths last year out of a total of 19, or 53% of the total. Livestock, every year, three to four farmers, you know, suffer fatalities with livestock. And this is something that farmers do on a daily basis. And, um, you know, it's a big issue all the time. Vits will, will tell us that uh, livestock are getting wilder, they're getting more difficult to handle. So how can we prevent this? 
good handling facilities, a good functioning cattle crush, and designed properly for the cattle being handled. For dairy and suckler farmers that are calving cows, a good calving gate where you can restrain the cow safely and work both yourself and anyone else uh, in doing, uh, you know, calving the cow safely. Bulls, again, very dangerous, and um, that the facilities on the farm would be adequate for the bull for the purposes uh, where you need to restrain them or do whatever work needs to be done. Machinery, again, four deaths last year, 21% of the total, and we'll focus a little more on the machinery and the tractors. Drowning and gas, again, these are interlinked. Um, every year, slurry gas accounts for one to two deaths on farms. It would appear maybe that the message isn't getting home to farmers that slurry gas is there in all slurry tanks. It starts to come, I suppose, available when, when the slurry tanks are agitated. And uh, even three weeks ago, it was a good spell of weather. Uh, a farmer told me that he lost two cows where he went agitating. Um, and he didn't, you know what I mean, he took a chance. He thought, you know, he'd leave the animals in. There wouldn't be much slurry gas. Maybe that would be worse later on in the season. But he lost two cows. I suppose he was lucky in that he didn't run in to save them. He might have got, got gassed himself. So we often think that what happens when the farmer is agitating, uh, he, he gets overcome by the gas and he falls into the tank. So, um, you know, he, he, it's, it's, it's recorded possibly as a drowning incident. But equally, when farmers are agitating, they're leaving, you know, the, uh, they're leaving a hole there for someone else maybe to fall into, into the tank. Uh, Neighbours maybe or someone else that's coming into the yard, maybe a salesman or something like that, possibly during a dark evening. Electrocution. Again, electricity is always dangerous. The standards of uh, installation have improved on farms, but you'll still have uh, farmers taking chances. So um, it's difficult to rely on maybe just one year's figures. So um, looking back over the last 10 years, 2011 to 2020, a 10 year uh, average there, I suppose, is the numbers of deaths. Uh, tractors, again, and, and vehicles like the quad bikes, uh, they, they, they're up there at the top, 91 fatalities out of a total of 210. Uh, the livestock are there again, 39. Again, more farmers killed now by cows than by bulls. So, uh, you know, suckler cows are dangerous, particularly at calving time, and particularly where farmers are, uh, you know, tagging or doing something with the calf. Machinery, again, fairly consistent there uh, all the time, 10% of all the fatalities. And the drowning and, and gassing there, uh, this hydrogen sulfide gas, as I said, is there in all tanks. And it's just, I suppose, to make farmers aware how dangerous it is. Um, to make sure that, uh, you know, when they go agitating, they remove the livestock, they make sure there are no pets, no children in the yard, and when they start the agitator, to move away themselves for at least 15 or 20 minutes. Something maybe that goes um, without too much attention is falls from heights. And again, big numbers there in terms of fatalities, 16 over the last uh, um, 10 years, nearly two per year. Um, Two years ago, there was a storm uh, done a significant amount of damage. There was no farmer, no person killed in the storm itself. But in the week after the storm, one farmer uh, fell from a roof where he was fixing gutters and got killed. And another farmer where he was cutting trees that were knocked in the storm, he got killed by falling branches. So uh, again, the awareness, I suppose, of, um, of roofs and working on heights, the farmers, I suppose, need to ask themselves, are they competent? Uh, to do this work? Should they get a contractor in if they have some repairs or some work to do on a roof? Is the roof structurally sound? A lot of old cubicle sheds and old buildings, uh, the timber might be gone rotten or maybe the steel gone rusty and weak. And we would say that a ladder should only be used for access to a farm building. It shouldn't be used for carrying out the work. And always have some fall protection in place, something like the bucket of a teleporter or a cherry picker. These can be hired from tool hire companies, and they're, I suppose, they're in every, pretty much every town. Falling objects, we're talking there maybe about bales of straw, bales of hay, uh, but also more recently bales of silage, particularly in good years where there's a surplus of grass silage, there's big stacks of round bales being made in farmyards. And uh, sometimes these bales are, are, are stacked very poorly, 
and when the farmers are you know taken taken from the stack over the winter period uh, the bale maybe falls on themselves or falls on someone that's maybe removing the plastic or the, the knit wrap from the bale. Um, cutting timber with chainsaws, again, it features there. And electrocution, again, with the, uh, with the electricity, uh, always, I suppose, an issue. And a few other points, I suppose, to bear in mind. 10% uh, of these accidents involve children. And 45% uh, of deaths are to farmers over 65 years of age. So that statistic in particular has been increasing. A lot of, I suppose, farmers are living longer. A lot of farmers, you know, are, are continuing to farm after the age of 65, but they need to ask themselves the question, is their mobility as good as it needs to be to, to get out of the way of livestock, get out of the way of fast moving farm machinery? Is their hearing good? Is their eyesight good? So um, the, the debts to the older farmers, that, that, that figure has, has, has increased. So as I said earlier, I want to focus maybe a bit more on the debts due to tractors and farm vehicles. And um, they account for a high proportion of all, all fatalities. So some of the injuries there, uh, a lot of farmers would think of maybe PTO shafts and, and entanglement as a major source of death. And indeed it can be. But uh, crushing injuries are being crushed um, where farmers are attaching on implements onto tractors implements are bigger and tractors are bigger and this can be um, I suppose a dangerous job being struck uh, by machines in the yard or you know um, we, we, uh, there was a case there down Wexford a few years ago where an elderly farmer went out to a farmyard to collect eggs that he'd done on a daily basis and his son was feeding silage with a teleporter and he was struck there's a poor visibility I suppose from certain uh, side with with these teleporters and uh, you know he was killed impacts again you know from moving machinery or or tractors uh, where someone is hit and uh, it causes fatalities being trapped again under machines again jacinta mentioned uh, a lot of farmers are working on their own always have a mobile phone with you uh, in some cases uh, you know these injuries would not be serious if if someone was there to get you out of trouble. Uh, again, a case where a farmer was moving bales of silage. The bales were heavy, the tractor was a little light, the tractor overturned, and he was trapped there overnight under the tractor and the uh, freezing cold night and uh, you know hypothermia killed the farmer. Falls from height, again, we, we, we talked about that. Um, quite an amount of, of uh, fatalities in this regard. If you're using a ladder, um, you know, you, you can get killed from the third rung of a ladder. A fall from the third rung of a ladder has caused fatalities. So ladders uh, need to be restrained by someone else, uh, you know, if you're accessing firm, firm, firm roofs. Being pierced by firm machinery, again, the way it's parked, and, um, you know, that could be the farmer himself, maybe out at night looking at a cow cavern or someone else in the yard, the likes of silage forks, shear grabs. These can be dangerous. Uh, items of equipment and again some of these things are interlinked but vehicle uh, rolling over um, and um, that accounted for 20 uh, deaths or 22 percent of the total again we talk about uh, you know uh, what has happened in the last number of years farmers feeding silage bales uh, where um, vehicles uh, roll over the farmer when he's out trying to take the plastic off the silage the handbrake maybe not working properly in the tractor or loader and the farmer gets rolled over or pinned along the barrier and crushed. Uh, again, overturning of, of, of tractors and, and, and farm vehicles. Uh, quite, quite a number of farmers there are killed in that regard. So, um, you know, we just want to make farmers aware, maybe more aware, and awareness probably is the key to these, uh, solving these uh, fatalities and farm accidents. And, um, you know, we're talking tonight about uh, fatalities, but you know, there's a serious economic loss from farmers getting injured uh, in, these, in these accidents, and these generally go unreported around the country. So you're talking about a crush injury there where farmers are attaching implements onto, onto, onto tractors, and be doing that on a regular basis, uh, maybe a couple of times a day, attaching on manure shakers maybe this time of the year, bale carriers, uh, sprayers, loads of different equipment. So there is a danger involved in doing these very simple of tasks. So, you know, again, as I say, awareness is the key and uh, 
farmers are very aware of the dangers of the PTO shafts. We have a good picture here of, you know, a PTO shaft that's very well covered and quite safe. But uh, there are plenty of other uh, things that can cause um, serious accidents and, and death. So again, Jacinta touched on some of these, uh, the, the driver uh, of, of these tractors. And again, tractors, you know, have got bigger and the potential is there for, you know, more serious accidents. That the driver is trained and competent in what he's expected to do. He has a valid license and insurance if he's going on the road that the windscreen and side windows are all in place and clean, that the visibility is good for the driver in the cab. Um, equally, you know, the windscreen, side windows and the doors are there to keep a farmer safe if the tractor rolls over or indeed to reduce the noise levels. Uh, noise levels, you know, once they go over 80 decibels can cause uh, damage to your hearing. And especially, you know, if you're working long hours, uh, these things need to be fairly right. Uh, wipers present again and in good working order. And we'd have to ask the question, you know, there's a lot of tractors out on farms and some of these things, you know, mightn't be in place. Again, mirrors present and working and these can get broken so easily with overhanging trees and hedges. The correct seating for the comfort of the operator and to reduce vibrations uh, coming up from the tractor and the body, you know, and that, that can do serious muscular uh, skeletal damage uh, over time. Lights and indicators. Some more checks there. Lights must be visible from the rear. Again, if you're out on the road, that road users coming from behind, they can see the tractor in time. Uh, beacons are expected on all tractors if they're on the road, again, to alert uh, other road users. U guards in place to cover PTO stubs. Hitching equipment free of defects. So, you know, there have been a lot of serious accidents and incidents and fatalities indeed, where limbs have been lost, uh, hands, uh, toes, uh, that sort of thing, you know, where hitching implements aren't working properly and farmers get, get trapped and get there. You have about a minute there, Tom. Okay. And tires, uh, again, are important that they're correctly inflated and, and correct for the job. So the in-cab checks again, controls clearly marked, you know, that the PTO and the accelerators and all these uh, um, controls are, are marked and identified and that they're working. Again, maintenance and uh, that on a tractor is very important. And again, these crush injuries uh, can be put down in a lot of cases to poorly working handbrakes and in some cases foot brakes and a clean cab floor. So finally, I suppose tractors and farm machinery are involved in almost 50% of farm debts. Keep your tractor in a good serviceable and roadworthy condition. We have an NCT for cares, um, no NCT yet for tractors, but certainly you know, from a safety point of view, um, these things need to be uh, kept monitored and kept up to date. Keep your steering and brakes working correctly. And again, your handbrake. And Jacinta touched on it, and I won't say too much about it. You know, the, the risk assessment is there and machinery is a big part of it. And just finally, Inda, I won't take up too much of the time. Uh, with the lockdown, we talked about a lot more children out there on farms. And look at uh, a little message to any of them if they're listening in tonight. Stay away from farm machinery, especially on busy days. And farm contractors will tell you when they come into yards, there could be three or four children running around. So that's a risk for them. The visibility from these big tractors mightn't be uh, as good as it needs to be. Watch out for delivery trucks and other big, big vehicles accessing yards. And, uh, you know, be careful with uh, trailers. Uh, you know, a lot of children have been hurt falling off these vehicles. And remember, under 14s are not allowed to operate tractors or similar machines. So that's it now, and a, a good rundown of uh, the... That's great, Tom. Um, I just ask you to stop sharing your screen there, Tom, and um, maybe everybody just to turn back on their, their videos. And I'll, at this stage, I'll hand over there to Vivian, who's um, handling the questions that's coming in online. There's still an opportunity for anyone that wants to ask a question to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So Vivian, I'll just hand over to you. Okay, thanks, Indy. Yeah, the questions are coming in here thick and fast, and you can still uh, type them into the Q&A section there, folks. And if we don't get them tonight, we'll answer them by email tomorrow, sometime tomorrow. So um, type in your questions as I'm asking them here. First one I have um, is for Jacinta in relation to the to the TAMS the Health and Safety Training Course. Jacinta, will a level 8 degree in agriculture suffice instead of the level six degree regarding the farm safety training needed for the Thames? 
Yeah, Vivian, I saw that question. To be honest, I haven't come across it before. I haven't heard of it being acceptable. Um, yeah. But I can get back to the individual and let them know. I, 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 from my memory, I think they do prefer that the department do prefer that the course, um, the health and safety course is done. I'm not sure if the degree, you know, content meets the requirements, but I will get back to that person. Okay, we'll get back to that by email sometime tomorrow. Thanks, Jacinta. While you have the microphone, Jacinta, there's another question for you. Um, could you tell me how I can get a new version of the book that you mentioned in your in your presentation? Yeah, uh, the majority of Chagas offices have them or to get one directly from the Health and Safety Authority to get through to them um, might be more direct. You know, like we'd, we'd have a, a small number in the offices at the time. So if the contact of the Health and Safety Authority directly would be more direct. Okay, and I suppose just on the course itself, Jacinta, um, uh, when are you planning to run them and uh, what? how long is the course and, and maybe a little clue or tips on the course content? Right. Um, I am. Um, the first course is uh, coming up on the thirty first of March, and that one is full. I hope to hold another one um, a month later, and again a month after that. So that we will be. We have a bit of backlog, obviously, from the lockdown. So we'll be going through the numbers. Um, the courses, um, the online version as well, is three to three and a half hours long. I would allow three and a half hours because we'll be taking a break in in the middle. And generally, the whole point of the course is to try and educate and improve awareness about pharma safety tips. I mean, Tom went through a load of examples there and it's, it's all about providing information. And um, we do show some videos as well of people that have um, been involved with either farm accidents or have lost somebody, unfortunately, due to a fatality. So that content is there just to make people aware of it. And as well as that, we go through the code of practice safety document in more detail. I mean, I just touched on one section there. So we go through all sections of that. And as well as that, it's a very valuable opportunity for people in the same background to share information and stories on things that have worked on their farms and how they help to improve safety, you know, so, and their daytime courses as well, by the way. Okay, that's good. Thanks, Jacinta. So all information there on the courses were on available from our Chagas office in Westport. Yeah. Um, one for you, Tom, Tom Kelly. Um, it, I suppose it's it's a general it's a general query for for the general public maybe as opposed to the farming community. What can people do when they see unsafe practices in their locality? We'll say young children maybe driving heavy machinery, travelling in cabs, etc. Um, many people in the countryside would be concerned about this, but don't know how to deal with it. Well, maybe get onto the farmer concerned wherever the you know the the farm business is that they're coming from. That the owner of the farm, as Jacinta said, there has the responsibility there to make sure that you know whoever is operating on this farm is 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 competent to do so and is operating to safe procedures. At the end of the day, if an accident occurs, that you know it'll be back to his responsibility to to ensure safe working practices are are, are followed. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, another question for Jacinta, uh, they just have to come in, Jacinta, uh, what actually happens when, when a health and safety official would come to your firm to carry out a firm and safety inspection? Yeah, well, it just comes to mind there, if, if somebody sees an unsafe practice like that, um, it would be very timely for a, an inspection. Um, basically, what an inspector is doing is there to advise and point out if there's anything on your farm that is that they think in their experience or knowledge is unsafe. Um, like I said, the examples that Tom gave, you know, like they, they would look at the enterprise on the farm. If it's cattle, for example, they'd be looking at the handling facilities to make sure that there's an isolation unit because as we all know how unsafe it is dealing with livestock, that um, they're looking for practical ways to point out things that can be improved on the farm to improve the safety and that when they walk away from that farm that they're comfortable in the knowledge that the farmer is doing the best they can to make their workplace as safe as possible to prevent accidents. Thanks Jacinta. Okay folks I think we're just a minute to go to time so thanks very much for the questions. Uh, we'll get back to any of them we haven't answered through email in the next day or two and I'll just ask Inda to close the, close the session. Uh, thanks very much, Vivian. Um, I'd just like to thank um, everybody that contributed tonight, um, Jacinta and Tom, and indeed Dr. Patrick McSherry. Um, I think they were all very good presentations, very informative. 
I'd like to thank Vivian there for handling the questions. And indeed, my colleague, Brendan Gary, who is behind the scenes, in case we tripped up or anything, he was there to save us. So um, thanks very much. And um, just to remind everybody, the recordings are available on um, the Chagash Mayo YouTube channel. And um, the previous two recordings are available there and also the future recordings. This um, will be on again next week. Um, the Chagash Mayo um, webinar series continuing next week. And um, we'll be looking forward to that as well. So thanks very much to everybody who contributes and good night and stay safe. And indeed, just one final thing. It's, uh, Dr. Patrick mentioned it there. If you have a farmer friend out there that you didn't talk to in a long time, pick up the phone, have a chat with them because in these times, um, isolation can be awful. And just pick up the phone after this webinar and have a chat with them. So on that note, I'll say good night to you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.